Hello, male and female micro-humans. Welcome to the Bomb Squad Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Hawker. I'm Austin Sweebelman. And <laughs> presenting our very special guest, Stephen Hero of Giant Robot FM, amongst other things. Real quick, Stephen, um, why don't you give us the, the lowdown on what you do? Maybe this is a bit of an exaggeration, but I like to think of myself as a Mecca notable online. I've been podcasting about Mecca shows for... At this point, three years with a little break in there at some times. And I've been also writing articles on the shows that we cover for our podcast. I'm using plural because I used to have another podcast, an older podcast, a now defunct podcast called Mechanations. That ended a few months ago, but we have my co-host and I, PMC Trilogy, have rebooted the podcast under the banner Giant Robot FM. So that is what I am doing during my off hours. I haven't done as much writing recently as I'd like, but if you want to check out my previous article, I've written about the three Pat Labor films. I've written about Gurren Lagan, some old school mecha video games like Zardion, and a bunch of other stuff too. For such publications as Zimmerit, Anime Herald, Anime Feminist, and a few other sites too. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll be sure to, um, for those listening on the YouTube platform, we'll sure, be sure to link those in the down there bit. It's awkward when I'm talking about myself and I forget like my credentials, because that always happens on the spot. It's like the equivalent of stage fright when you're on a podcast. I don't know what you call that. I'm in the comfort of my own home, of course, but there's still, like, when you get in front of a mic, you just forget things. No, no, I definitely get that. Yeah, no. Stage fright, go away. This is my big... There's a, there's a Robotech reference for all you fans. Um, and speaking of Robotech, um, this is sort of coming on the heels of uh, Stephen Hero's coverage over on uh, Giant Robot FM. But today, we're going to be discussing Macross. Do you remember Love? The uh, feature film adaptation of the original SDF Macross television series. Sort of in the wake of that, which, just confirming, Austin and Stephen... Well, Austin technically saw it, like a half a year ago around. And Steven, this was your first time watching, correct? Yeah, my sum total of experience with Macross is now Macross Plus, the four episode OVA, Macross Plus Movie Edition, which is a compilation film of sorts with some added scenes. And then this film, Do You Remember Love? So I'm still like a Macross newbie. I think these are two really good places to start. And uh, as we start, I'll go into sort of a very, very brief history of Macross. Do you remember love? If you're interested in like the specifics of SDF Macross, I highly recommend that you listen to the Giant Robot FM episode zero that they did where they cover not just Macross Plus's history, but also um, SDFs and sort of Shoji Kaomori's rise, as well as um, Mercury Falcon's uh, The Birth of Macross video, which I was a uh, fact checker on, which means I didn't do much aside from say, hey, there's a few things here and some more information. But it's a really good video and I highly recommend it. And uh, for, for more Macross coverage in general, since I'll give them a shout out, there's a podcast, Dude, You Remember Macross, uh, hosted by Coop at Writer Strike on Twitter, who's a cool dude um, and does a lot of Macross stuff. Definitely check out their work. But um, getting into a brief history of this film specifically um, and, and its sort of overall significance, Macross Do You Remember Love was sort of a direct response to the failings of the television series. The television series was hamstrung by budgetary restraints and everything, and they wanted to capitalize on its immense success, of course. So they made a brand new film with Tatsunoko, but not just Tatsunoko, Studio Topcraft, who was at the same time working on a little film called Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. This was one of their few domestic productions, actually, as a Japanese studio, because mostly they did contract work for Rankin Bass. Most notably, um, the work that got them animation work on Nausicaa was The Last Unicorn, the 1982 mm. Peter S. Beagle adaptation. All their fantasy stuff was Topcraft's realm. And of course, Topcraft would later, um, after going bankrupt and being bought by Toshio Suzuki and a little pair known as Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki, they would become, you know, Studio Ghibli, best known for films like My Neighbor, the Yamadas and um, The Secret Life of Arietti, uh, <laughs> Tales of Earthsea, all the classics. Quite a pedigree we're coming into. And of course, the film itself is directed by Noboro Ishiguro and uh, Shoji Kawamori in a double role, the two titans of the industry. Ishiguro is probably one of the most significant anime directors that don't people don't talk about quite so much as maybe they should. The man behind um, Megazone 2, 3, Part 1, which we covered here before, Space Battleship Yamato, the original television series and film, uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, amongst many, many others. 
and so this film was an incredibly high budget event. It was hugely popular. Like um, in Otaku no Video, they have a snippet where they talk about it, and it was sort of like a Phantom Menace thing where people were waiting outside the theater to see it, and it was sort of like the biggest event since, and possibly even surpassing like the anime New Century Declaration with Yoshiyuki Tamino and the um, Gundam films premiere amongst like the otaku community, even a bit broader because Macross had more broad appeal even than Gundam, and it was this yeah this tremendous watershed moment, I and mean, it really cemented I think Macross's place in the popular culture. Um, like, do you remember Love? Is what they're going to be referencing like visually, and is what's going to inform the visual style of Macross material moving forward, as we'll discuss further. And sort of a brief history of its English releases. We didn't get it. We were supposed to get it at one point. It was going to be adapted as a Robotech film, but because of the rights issues surrounding it, which I believe are because it was licensed to Toho at this point by Tatsunoko um, well in advance, uh, they weren't able to license it with their good voice actors. And so instead we got a really good dub, two really good dubs, so one an edited version, Clash of the Bionoids, and we did get an unedited tape release of this film, just as Space Fortress Bancross, but it was just the dubbed version, no English subtitles, unfortunately. And as of right now, it's in legal limbo, aside from bootleg copies like my bootleg DVD, which is currently sitting on my shelf along with the bootleg bonus soundtrack it came with. I didn't know it was a bootleg. I bought it when I was 12, so I'll, I'll cut myself some slack on this one. That sort of leads me to my first question, which, you know, when I was 12 going to this, I had certain expectations going to this. What were your expectations going to this? Uh, let's start with Austin. My closest expectation for a mecha anime before running into Ethan would probably have been watching <laughs> G Gundam growing up. That's where I'm from, uh, which I'm allowed to rep now because it's. I recently learned that it was one of two Gundam shows that had a TV rating over 4% during the 1990s real robot decline in Japan. Uh, and from G Gundam, from what I can recall, is just a series of episodes where people exclaim that they cannot afford to lose and then do special moves with very long titles at each other. But my other stronger point of reference, thanks Ethan, is Megazone 2-3 Part 1, some 42 episodes ago now. Uh, another Noboru Ishiguro film, same art style, a cerebral plot, love story, larger than life pop idol, floating space station full of people, etc. I had no idea the historic importance of Do You Remember Love? So my expectations going in was that it would be similar to Megazone 2-3, except that it would be annoying because it's vaguely related to that Robotech show that everybody deeply hates. Man. <laughs> okay. You're not wrong, but also... I was very wrong. Uh, there are dozens of Robotech fans left. There are literally dozens of us. <laughs> there are dozens of us. Dozens! <laughs> yes, exactly. Tens of people who still read the novels. Steven, um, what were your expectations going in? I wish I had a more storied history to give you, but it was two days ago when I was on the elliptical and decided I need to start taking notes on Do You Remember Love that I decided to finally jump in at the ripe old age of 33 years old. But I had an idea of what I was in for. Like as a, as a self-proclaimed mecha notable, I know if you tell me the genre or the sub-genre, assuming it's under the larger umbrella of anime and tell me the decade it came out, I could probably guess a lot of the major beats. Not to pigeonhole this stuff, but often it's very archetypal. And Do You Remember Love has a pretty elevated position in the fandom, so I kind of knew what I was in for. Like two days ago, or three days ago, if you were to come up to me right before I watched the film, I would have said, and you asked me, like, well, Steven, what are you in for? I would have said, and I'm quoting a fictional scenario here, I think it's going to be a fun space romp. You know, you're going to have some stellar 80s animation, probably some catchy tunes that, of course, is Macross. But I'm going to guess it's going to be weak on characterization and light on themes. And, and you know what? I think I called my shot. My fictional shelf self really called a shot. I think I, I agree with that. I think I... I would have especially agreed with that before I revisited it for this podcast. I think there's a bit more more substance than I remembered um, when I was younger. Because when I was younger, sort of getting into my own expectations, I just finished watching, because I watched Robotech and the original Macross back to back, um, both the original, like the English adaptation and the um, original Japanese version. So I, I kind of had an idea of what I was getting into. Um, I was first very surprised by the dub because for some reason I thought it was going to be the ADV cast. It was not mm -hmm. the ADV cast. And again, like I didn't really know about rights and that sort of thing, how things worked in the real world. So that was a bit of a shock to hear that opening. We weren't able to attack, then they have very strong defense. 
male and female micro humans and all that um <laughs> and it was gorgeous and it was light on characterization it definitely like it was a bit of a shock going from the television series to the um the film and i sort of i would watch it a lot because there it was uh, there was a brief period of time where i had no no internet so that's it's like lovely no yeah. no internet that sounds lovely ethan it was for like a little bit. It was it was great for a bit, but I had like a handful of DVDs, and one of them was this bootleg of Do You Remember Love, um, which I watched a lot. And I think for a while it kind of soured. I was a little, almost a little soured on it, um, or like it was like I started noticing the problems. They became more glaring with every watch. But upon this review, I'm like, oh wait, no, there's a lot of good here. There's still a lot. That's interesting. And speaking of my thoughts on the film, what were your guys' overall thoughts on it and how it sort of holds together as, as a whole piece, um, I suppose? Um, I guess we'll start with Austin again. The key thing that stands out when you immediately engage with Do You Remember Love is the effect that it has on me as a person who's produced a black and white traditional animation but never used cells or studied the lost magic deeply enough to feel satisfied or learn the nomenclature. And that is, it's absolutely maddening. That's what stands out. I regularly see <laughs> shots where I can't for the life of me guess what techniques they use to make the images happen. I know I'm good at putting the cart before the horse here because there's a question about this later, but the most striking thing about this movie, at least to me as someone who hasn't seen the show, Macross, is the mind-blowing animation. And in a more holistic sense, I'd say that it does hold together today because like for science fiction, it contains a creation myth explaining the origin of humanity, a genetically engineered race of clones who forgot the one thing that humans are completely obsessed with. Uh, it goes about as far as possible without delving into postmodernism, you know, things like meta narrative or multiverse theory, which is getting popular. It holds up about as well as any Philip K. Dick novel, assuming you like jammed a copy of Wuthering Heights in between the pages. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> that is a particularly interesting perspective on it, because I, I think that's that's there, like the way it plays, especially with time, I think, and, and people's perception. They do a little bit of several interesting things with that, um, which is very, very dick of it um, in, in concert with its romantic element. Yeah, once it started jumping into all like the prehistory stuff and the ancient civilization, I was like Leonardo DiCaprio from Django. Like you had re you had my attention at that point. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> fascinating, the sort of internal mythology and the, the divides it creates between it, the Zentron and Meltron and everything. Like it, it captures your imagination um, in an interesting way. But Stephen, your overall thoughts on the film? Yeah, so I watched this like immediately after wrapping up Macross Plus. So I had a lot of fun seeing how the two were in conversation. Like, for example, Matt Cross Plus, the high-budget OVA, came out 10 years after this. So it came out, in st it started releasing in 1994. This film, of course, came out in 1984. And I had fun picking out, like, all the character dynamics, plot beats, motifs that would later become franchise staples. So it's Macross, so you gotta have a love triangle. You need a love triangle. You need a lot of, bunch of ace pilots. A lot of them are gonna be D-bags. You need a galactic threat. <laughs> You need some fighter jets. You got to put butts in the seats. Idol singers, concerts. But of course, that wasn't always the case because there was a foundation. So this was like the beginning. And it was really enlightening as a mecha fan to see where that all came from. But I guess like that's a really hyper-specific observation because you would have to have just seen Macross Plus or another Macross series to come to that conclusion. So a more general take for me would be I appreciated how cosmic it was. And like for lack of a better term, how... 70s this movie feels. I know, of course, it came out in 1984. Like, maybe it's the film's dynamic color palette, but everything feels very psychedelic and exotic. It has a real energy to it. As the characters jet set across the galaxy, it really does take your breath away. And like Austin said, the animation, the fidelity of animation is absolutely stellar. Like, I think, too, like, Hikaru's Day with Minmei and the Rings of Saturn, crash landing on a desolate planet with, like, purple f thunderstorms, and then you find out it's Earth. Like, that stuff is so weird and cool. Of course, a few of the Gainax boys worked on Do You Remember Love? Hideaki Anno was a key animator on it. So you could definitely draw a line from something like Macross, the, either, either the show or the Do You Remember Love film, and you could draw a line right to that, to Gunbuster, which was m one of my personal favorite mecha shows from the 1980s. And that was a lot of fun to see. And also gorgeous to watch. For sure, for sure. Yeah, especially with the Mikimoto uh, character designs throughout both. I think Mikimoto is a spectacular designer, and I love always love seeing his character designs in 
in animation. And then Gunbuster, it's interesting seeing how it's polished. Yeah, and particularly another Gainax production, sort of commenting on your uh, description of this as a very 70s sort of film, visually in a lot of ways, just a few years later with uh, Wings of Aniyamis, there's such a divide, like a stark contrast in visual styles in like Wings of Aniyamis, uh, ostensibly being a response to this film in many ways, but having a much more muted palette, being looking a lot more modern by most standards. Ethan, kudos for you to not just simply saying Royal Space Force, because I always bungle the actual name, so I will just say Royal Space Force. Wait, are yep. we talking about that expensive Gainax film? Yeah, their, their big premiere feature that bombed. Yeah, just sort of the way they're in concert with one another. Um, ah, I see what you did there, a little pun, Ethan, in yeah. concert. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My overall thoughts on the film, getting into it briefly, is I still love it. Uh, it's still gorgeous. Um, it's still frustrating because the side characters obviously get very short shrift, and despite being one of the better parts. Uh, Roy, Roy is ruined in this movie. <laughs> He's so, like, Roy in the original series. Wait, so is there, there is a show that reclaims Roy? Because I'm, I would be interested to watch that. <laughs> Roy in the original is, he's informed by Slegger Law from Gundam. Yeah, I could totally see that. But the, but the thing is, Roy in Do You Remember Love is just like Slegger Law. Like, he's just exactly the same. In the television series, he's like, what if Slegger Law kind of grew up and became a better person? Um, mm. Or at least just more conscientious kind of person. His spoiler, spoiler alert, death, because he also dies in the TV series, is a lot more muted um, and tragic. In a lot of ways, yeah, he, he's done very dirty by this film. Even dirtier than poor Kakazaki, who um, unceremoniously gets gunned down by, by Melia. There's so much gorgeous animation, um, not to emphasize the, the things that I'm frustrated by, but like that section right between Minmei and Hikaru being rescued and Minmei and Hikaru's date. Hate it. It's not good because that's the one with all the side characters where they're just like sort of paper thin representations mm. of themselves. And when, you know, Hikaru is probably at his most obnoxious. And yeah, like when they're, when Roy is there to say things about w women. Just watch Jet Jockey in action. Mm. <laughs> 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 You're taking all my talking points for your next question there, Ethan. <laughs> wow, well, yeah. No, but um, but I love it. I had a really great appreciation for the stuff on Earth, too, with uh, Hikaru mm. and Misa, um, just because there's no clear analog to it in the television series, I think. It, it's the most original creation of this film in a lot of ways, even more than the aesthetic differentiation. And I really, really loved it. And of course, the final battle sequence is very impressive, despite a caveat, which I'll get to in the... in the. I'll save that one for the animation section. But yeah, moving on to the uh, sort of the main narrative draw. Your thoughts on the Misa, Hikaru, Minmei love triangle. Let's lead with you, Stephen. All right, so I have some spicy takes here. Do you want me to start with the good or the bad? Let's get the bad out of the way. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> I, I think Do You Remember Love's most glaring blemish is the way it handles gender. Whenever I go into an anime production from the 80s, this is what I'm expecting, but I feel like <laughs> the bad gender takes were like amped up in this film to like the nth degree, and it really comes out with the love triangle. Like, Min Mei is clearly written from the perspective and through the lens of a bunch of dudes who are in their 20s, which doesn't necessarily make it bad, because Gunbuster has the same production history, but I feel like Gunbuster handles its principal characters a lot better. Like, her dialogue, at least the dialogue featured in this film, a lot of it is very, I don't know, sophomoric. She's portrayed as naive, hypersexualized at times in a way that's uncomfortable. I feel like I have to say that I have to trot out that comment with every single anime I watch, but still, nonetheless, I was really... Actually, for the first time in a long time, I was pretty comfortable with the fan service in Macross Plus, the fan service that wasn't related to scenes of sexual trauma. Here, though, I feel mm. like I feel like those 10 years have eroded. Animators commodify her as an object for both audiences, you know, the audiences who actually exist in this world who are watching her, and we, the viewers. And I feel like they doesn't really have any interesting to say about that. Macross Plus, the framing on the principal character is much more interesting. The principal character's name is Myung, and... She's very much commodified as an object on screen, but I feel like the show is also commentating on that. But here I feel like there's no commentary. That's not to say I don't think Min Mei has any redeeming qualities. She has a certain spunk to her that I find charming, but I don't think she's fully realized. For me, she comes across more as a caricature meant to attract audiences or in some cases, titillate audiences. I don't want to double down too much on this. I have some negative things to say about gender in this, but like anytime they're talking about gender, I want to scream. like. Whenever someone starts in this film, a man should be blank and a woman should be blank. I'm <laughs> like, no. <laughs> the film employs so many off-putting stereotypes that also come across as very boring and just ill thought out. 
And that's why I asked you earlier, Ethan, with the Roy Fokker bit, because I feel like the film adores him. And I feel like the film at times pushes back against his notion of, you know, women enjoy force and women enjoy kind of being dominated. But the film really does turn him into a martyr. So I feel like it only elevates his views a bit. I'm going Mm. on here, so please uh, push back against me. I I get what you mean, definitely with the Roy stuff. I think it does sort of, it relies on your knowledge of the television series to sort of fill in the blanks on the characterization and that sort of thing. Because like the Roy in this film is completely insufferable if you have no idea of like uh, the sweet Roy, the one, the tender one that could be kind to Claudia and would worry about Hikaru in the early days and that sort of thing. So it is being a bit overly reliant, I think, on your knowledge of the television series in that respect. And I think um, I've always had issues with Hikaru and and Misa on some level in the way um, more in the television series than, than even here um, and how they can be kind of overly subject to the whims of the world around them I suppose like mm. they're very passive in a lot of ways that's the word I'm looking for but I, I do love Minmay in my own way I love as a character there's something wonderfully tragic I, I do not like the way they portray her but I think it kind of pushes back on that almost objectification in some ways you hear a brief snippet of her her singing Cinderella <laughs> which I'll get into more Mm. later, but I just, I love that track and I think it adds a lot to her character, a lot of sort of subtle fragility. I will say I had some good, like I I do enjoy the dynamics of the love triangle a bit. Maybe I just have Robert Pattinson on the brain. I'm channeling the interview with Zoe Kravitz that went viral when he's talking about FF7, but I can't help but see Aerith and Tifa in Min May and Misa (laughs) respectively. Like Aerith, you got Min May, she's creative. She exudes a much more carefree nonchalance and she's got a lot of spunk, like I said, and yeah, Misa is the Tifa corollary here. Misa is more reserved. She's protective of those she cares about. She has like big mom energy <laughs> and she's definitely more professionally driven. And I'm going to like walk back my entire argument when I asked you to. Did you have a favorite girl? Because I'm going to go with, I'm going to stand Misa here because I stand Tifa in Final Fantasy VII. For some reason, Min May, I, I can't really explain it. She's best girl. I've got a thing written out. I don't know why, but it's <laughs> personal affection. I'm, I'm probably going to lean towards, I'm, in the film, I'm going to say Min May. Uh, in the television series, probably still Misa. My own issues with them aside, like frustrating elements. But yeah, no, I just, I, I really like Min May in this film. Just there's a few, a few extra things added to her characterization towards the end that make her so, so relatable in, in a big way. But I definitely get the appeal of Misa again, because I, I do prefer her maybe in the television series. Austin, thoughts on the love triangle? It really teeters because of the limitations of a feature film. Uh, Sometimes the female leads can feel like they're reduced to just their blind desire to be with Hikaru. I I read this lovely essay on the anime subreddit written by some user named Cloudflow. Their points resonated with me, so I'm repeating some of them here. Hikaru sees Minmei as a pop idol first and a person kind of second. He's also acting on the influence of his fellow pilots like Fokker, who have instilled him with misogynistic values like that he's gotta be cool and chicks. Min may see Sikuru as a way to escape the stress she's feeling, having become a pop idol, or finding out that her parents died on Earth. And they're essentially not on a deeper level with each other. Meanwhile, Hikaru and Hayase manage to break through each other's barriers and discuss sadness, deal with loss, get to know each other personally beneath what they appear to be. So it's a gr- it's great that things end the way they do, and the film sort of sweetens the deal by having a moment where Hayase and Minmei have that quiet moment where they can be framed as characters outside of what Hikaru does. And I, I, I think it's solid. I definitely do get the points that Steven is making about them making Fokker into a martyr, though. I didn't, <laughs> no, I didn't I, think about that. <laughs> I do. I, f- I feel like I came just like I came out swinging, and I feel like I sucked all the air out. Like that's what happened when someone had, like on a podcast has such a hot take. Like how do you <laughs> walk that back? But you, also, you brought up some good points. I wanted to the echo the two scenes in the beginning, or I guess one happens about midway through when it's the the both couples and they're for what you know whatever reason they are stranded or trapped in this one singular environment and they get to know each other those scenes land with me more than some of the other scenes i think those are strongest on characterization i do feel like this film gets being young and in love pretty well the scene where it's mid may and ikaru the montage scene where they're like shopping and shit like that and going you know doing like date stuff that montage lands for me it reminds me of the the much spoof scene from 500 Days of Summer with Zoe de Chanel and Joseph Gordon Levitt, you know, when they're on the IKEA just goofing off. Like that scene resonates with, I think, I would assume a lot of young couples who do similar stuff. And that scene in Do You Remember Love hit home the most, I think, for just like nailing a time and place and atmosphere. 
for sure. I think um, my, my own thoughts in brief, I, I definitely get what Austin's getting at. I think it's good at consolidating things in a big way because it, it has so much ground to cover. And I think the juxtaposition between the time spent with Hikaru and Minmei and the time spent with Hikaru and Misa gives you a really good idea of their characterization and the way they form attachments with one another in a really interesting way. There's a lot more, I don't know, moments where it's clear that Hikaru and Misa are able to connect on a dead earth, even with both are very desperate situations, but um, the one with Hikaru and Misa seems uh, considerably more desperate in like an existential way. I would love to read that Ursula Le Guin short story, which is the two of them <laughs> stranded on that like f***ed up earth with the purple lightning. Oh, God. yeah, it does have like sort of the way that relationship is, is written and presented is un unusually good, even compared to like the television series. It does have like a left hand of darkness feeling or that sort of thing. Mm. Or, uh, it is very Le Guin um, in a way that's it's really good. I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, I just love the way that it's framed. And then, yeah, the final moment where Misa and Minmei are sort of able to look at each other and recognize one another. It wraps everything all up in a nice bow in a way that feels good. I like it. But uh, moving on to other things, I like quite a bit. Let's talk about the visuals for this film because it's a real pretty movie. Steven, if you'd like to launch into that. When I was writing my notes to this, I was like, the visuals whip ass. And I feel like I had trouble elaborating on that. Because, you know, I was told by many, many fans that it's a visual treat, and they certainly were not wrong. I think most impressive is the way this film nails scale and scope, which is something I invoked Gunbuster before, that Gunbuster does really well. The SDF-1 is a gigantic floating city, and as a viewer, I feel awed just watching the way this massive installation operates, flies through space. Seeing how the people make a home within it is just a joy to watch, and all the cool gadgetry that is contained within is also very cool to watch. In some respects, I think Do You Remember Love shares a lot of DNA with kaiju flicks. Like, kaiju flicks work because you have this massive monster that's romping through and stomping through a city, and the way the film plays with scale, it makes you as a viewer viewers seem small by comparison, but you can't help but like not turn your eyes away. There's something divine about it, or at least that's why I think the appeal of Godzilla films are. And that sense of scale is really present, I would say, in the first half of this movie, where like the, the attack occurs on the SDF-1, and you just see, just to watch this gigantic, huge-ass mech slash like, living community operate. It's just very cool. And those are my favorite shots, I think, in the entire film. Yeah, yeah. The, the scenes of destruction in the city and that sort of thing are super impressive. Like, they, they hearkened almost to, like, the sequence in Gundam F-91 with the, the combat in that cityscape. There's a lot of weight to the movement of them in those situations. The way the Zentron are sort of struggling with the artificial gravity where they're just sort of tumbling around is really interesting, and I love I love that effect. And, like, the way that they're sort of struggling to get their bearings in a lot of ways is very effective. And, of course, you know, um, very impressive, all the background elements being animated on top of the um, movement. The depth of field in some of these shots is wild and just how detailed it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Austin, thoughts on the visuals? Ethan, you spoke on the Sailor Moon podcast on backgrounds that change perspective with the subjects being hard to animate. So I looked out for those. Uh, the two that stood out the most is a shot of uh, Hikaru trying to catch Minmei when everything goes vertical inside Macross. Uh, it shifts perspective like three different times in the shot. The other is when Hikaru breaks, uh, breaks into the big bad ship at the end and fires a load of missiles while going up a tunnel. <laughs> that was bonkers. Hilariously, this is weird. The bar scene where Roy Falker says a bunch of sexist things and Misa and Hikaru uh, get to meet face to face for the first time. Uh, it has some funny optical flexing in it. The glowing drink outlines, which somehow move when, during one shot when Roy is messing with his drink. Then there's that damn fountain in the background <laughs> the, with the prismatic lines going up it. I would kill to know how they did that effect. And there's dozens more, but I'm assuming somebody else wants to say the shot where Minmei and Hikaru are floating in the huge window. So I'll just stop there before I run out the clock. I, I presume you mean towards the very end. When, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I love the yeah the transition there um, as they're just sort of floating in space. It's just striking visual leading right into the final battle. Yeah, massively impressive. You're seeing the battle going on in the background on top of it. Yeah, just the layers of action there are so impressive. There's so much in the way of gorgeous visuals here. Regarding my own thoughts, it's it's always weird, sort of the strange idiosyncrasies, which are almost like 
1930s like Disney feature isms, I would say, like in a strange way, like the way that the clothes kind of cling to their bodies or they're sometimes their fingers or like weird sausage fingers in a way that's charming. Like it doesn't feel like it's out of place. It's like here's an opportunity to really flex and do full feature animation and they that they aren't necessarily used to in a big way. So like there are of course going to be little idiosyncrasies and like anatomy and that sort of thing when you're working with that level of detail for the first time. There are some aesthetic things that frustrate me about this film, um, not just in terms of animation quality, but like, I don't love the character, like I understand it and particularly for this film, the way the Zentron and the Meltron are depicted, they're sort of exaggerated in this major way that they aren't in the television series. Like Meltron have heels on their, their flight suits now, and they like all their, their designs are the sleek ones and they, they make the their Kuei Lun Rao power armor hot pink instead of the green it was in the television series. And they give um, Melia more more makeup than she already had in the television series. And they make all the Zentron these hideous, disgusting monsters with big pulsating brains and gold bulldoza is built into his ship. The whole gender war thing too is like a little little suspect, but it was a, an old concept from the, the original pitch for the television series and it works for consolidating the narrative here, I think. So I accept it. But like the visual the visual flourishes are kind of frustrating as someone who likes the Zentradi and likes them being characterized as a bit more interesting. Are the Zentradi in the original show just as tall? Yes, they're still they're still giants, but they are mm. um just less monstrous looking on their face. They have ships and everything but the and they're sort of organic looking but it's a bit more unified across the the genders there um like gold boldles as a dude he's just a real real big guy instead of a big computer man also his name is boldles which sounds like bulldozer i love that um but I, I still love the visuals and even those new designs even if i don't like them on like a like a narrative level i still like them i like them a lot Bulldoze's big fortress, looks, which looks like a big mono-eyed cactus buffeted on two sides by onions. That's a very evocative <laughs> bit of imagery there, Ethan. That's very good. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when I saw it. And I love it. Uh, or, yeah, like Laplamese, the leader of the Meltron forces, who's like a floating, completely different sort of floating head. Bulldoze, I love her appearance, even if you barely see her. The Zentron stuff is always what I sort of glom onto. The redesigned Macross looks gorgeous with all its new detail and its new armor armed carrier arms um, in place of the old battleships. One other quick complaint, though, is I uh, love the final battle sequence. I think it's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. I think it's incredible. It's so layered with detail. Uh, it's layered with too much detail. My biggest issue is sort of comparing it to the television series. The storyboarding on it, like the same fight in the television series, everything's a bit more choreographed. Like in that, that episode, things run together in a way where the composition of each scene flows better into one another. So as opposed to in this one, it's a bit hard to keep track of what's going on. Like the, the movement as they move in towards Dolza's fortress, because there's so many. The image the, is so dense with activity, it almost doesn't carry the eye terribly well. Like each individual scene can be super well appreciated just on its own. It's just like when you're watching it, I think. I don't know if it's as like effective a storytelling tool as it is in the television series, even if it is like this awe-inspiring feat of animation, if that makes sense. I, I see what you're saying. It's some of that, is, it's so busy that sometimes it's hard for the human eye to track. Maybe not for the Zentradi eye, but for the human eye, definitely. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> they have those little robot eyes too, so they're good. The final battle scene though, the sense of scope is just magnificent. I will never not stand up in my seat and start hooting and hollering when you get like a thousand battleships and another thousand battleships and they all face each other and they let loose their lasers and their Atano circuses. That stuff is always mesmerizing. Yeah, the animation by, um, of course, uh, Itano, all those Itano circuses you see in like the opening is great where they're fighting the battle pod that's a great sequence, that dog fight. That's sort of exactly what I want in terms of really great choreography. Um, and of course, to be fair to this movie, episode 27 of SDF Macross is probably one of the greatest feats of television animation ever made. You just dropped down the gauntlet there. Yeah, like um, at, at least up to that point. But even then, I think it's fantastic. It looks exceptional to this day. And so it's not like I'm comparing it to just a random episode or anything. But the film the film as a whole is still drop dead gorgeous throughout, even with its, with its sort of curious idiosyncrasies and that sort of thing. The amount of detail in the backgrounds and multiplane animation. I think they had like 10 cell layers um, as opposed to the typical five 
that they could work with on a television production. Um, so obviously you're just seeing a lot more stuff going on. There's a lot more background animation and that sort of thing. Shoji Kawamori crops up at a uh, signing for Minmei, and I think he, it's, he dies, basically. So that's cute. That's fun. <laughs> um, there's a guy with like a slack jaw and his big and thick brow that's supposed to be him, which is very funny. Just a lot of little cute Easter eggs like that throughout. But I can gush about the visuals for, for far too long, but I won't. I'm done. Um, <laughs> music. Let's talk about the soundtrack, which is, of course, essential to every Macross production. Austin, what were your thoughts on the uh, soundtrack for this film. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay a little bit low on this one. You know, I think that uh, Seiko Matsuda, her music sounds nostalgic if you ever just stop and listen to it. And I think that they capture that quality here with the Lin Min Minmay songs. There's lots of great lyrics about like longing for what has been lost and purple prose to pair with the crazy cosmic war story. But as somebody who knows virtually nothing about music theory, I'm just gonna say it worked. It was great without elaborating further. Sorry. No, no, that's all good. I, I probably won't have a ton to say. There's just like one thing that really stood out in my mind and I felt almost obligated to say it because it's a Macross thing. You got to talk about it at least a little bit. Steven, your thoughts on the soundtrack? Yeah, I'm gonna have to echo a lot of Austin's thoughts here. I don't have any like biting criticisms about the film's music. It's all great stuff. I do appreciate the fact that so the music is incorporated very cleverly and very smartly to create a very nice rhythm in the film like you have a lot of high highs and the low lows but like when you have a very intense battle sequence chances are right after the battle sequence you're going to have a nice like pop song and I do like that almost denouement in the whenever in the film that happens it creates a nice balance and as a viewer i really do appreciate that the music's all good you got some fun pop tunes do you guys have any favorite songs like pop songs from it the part where she says slayer three times oh um xiao pai lan little white dragon that's a good one i think it's a very fun one i, I really like xiao pai lan my favorite song of hers like period is, um probably even more than than the title track you know do you remember love is um you see you hear a brief snippet of it and i believe it was mari ijima's like what she submitted when she was auditioning in part or it was like a demo track she recorded before she did Macross was um, Cinderella. It's a song she sings by herself when she's with Hikaru and I love it because it creates such a like it's such a soft sweet song that really you get a sense of vulnerability from her that like real emotional vulnerability that she kind of hides behind being sort of giggly and silly a lot of the time or like the facade of being an idol really more than like the facade of being anything else um and it's such a sweet song um and you just hear a little bit of it but it, it really cuts to the quick of her her characterization and adds a lot to her that i think if it was cut i would miss for her as opposed to you know all of her very produced later music throughout the film which is all you know what you would think of when you think of J idol stuff from the very early 80s which is all good it's all fun but it's not quite my speed i guess a lot of it i'm more of a megazone 2 3 guy i like kumi miyasato a lot and all of her tracks and i like stuff that's a bit has a bit more energy to it so it's all good and it all works for me but it's not something i, I pursue quite so much out outside and kentaro honda's score is very effective but again like it, i think it works best in the context of the film it doesn't stand on its own like um shiro sagasu's soundtrack for Mega Zone again. I do like how funky the, the score is, though. Like, the battle themes, there's a lot of funk to it, which I appreciate. It reminds me a lot of 0079 in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and my own thoughts, again, I guess Cinderella um, is the big thing that I'm always glomming onto. Speaking of uh, soundtracks, this film has an English language soundtrack that was produced upon the initial release uh, that we mentioned, you know, the Clash of the Bionoids, 90-minute cut of this film, and then the unedited version we got over here. So unless you were importing Laserdiscs or you had a p Japanese pen pal, who was sending you a copy. Uh, this was the only way you could watch this particular film in the States. That's interesting. Is that score any good, Ethan? Oh, no, it doesn't. The Clash of the Bionoids doesn't have a separate score, unfortunately. Oh, I imagine okay. if they'd been done a Robotech version, it would have had a separate score. That would have mm. been interesting. But no, the when I, when I say soundtrack, I guess I mean like audio track for it. Oh, um, I see. Of course. Well, there, there are a couple songs in this. There's a Swedish version dub of this film where they dubbed all the songs, which is interesting. Hey, allihopa! Jag heter Lin Ming Mei. They do a good job for what they have. I'll grant them that. Well, actually, there is another English soundtrack. There's a fan dub of this film, and the voice actress Christina V, who plays, I believe, Sailor Mars, and like she became a, a real deal proper voice actress after doing this fan dub where she played Lin Min May. So I thanked them for everything and told them I would do my best and one day become a famous singer. 
Uh, and it was sort of, I believe, like her jumping off point. Yeah, most notably, she played um, Sailor Mars in the Viz dub of uh, Sailor Moon, amongst many other things. She's a real, real name. If you really want to watch this movie in English, that's probably your best bet. It's a fan dub, but it's one of the better ones I've heard. And I think Christina V has a, does a good, really good job as Midnight. But, but no, we're talking about the Toho dub, baby. Male and female micro-human. That's right. They were together. They seem to be friends. Austin, do you want to lead us <laughs> off on this? Heinous for the most part. First of all, it's confusing that they used the Japanese Mari Ijima tracks for every song except for one. That deviation raised an eyebrow of mine. There are times that the large gap you can close speaking Japanese compared to how slowly some English rolls out is very noticeable, particularly when Minmei and Hikaru are trapped inside the engine block and Hikaru is talking like he had a stroke. One scene that completely gets recontextualized to be blindingly dumb is when Hikaru and uh, Misa are on Earth and he laments about taking Minmei out to Saturn. Saturn. In Japanese, Misa is trying to get him to shut up about being sad and patrol the Earth and do his job. In the English dub, uh, Misa says, oh, it's our duty to go on patrol, referencing the illegal joyride. Like, it's, they, they f*** that up. And there are so many broken lines, and the Zentradi sound terrible. It's a trash tier dub. I thought it was very funny. I get why you like it. I mean, I'm going to echo a lot of what Austin says, because I don't... I have a feeling, Ethan, you grew up with this dub and you have a lot of nostalgia for it. Am I correct in that? <laughs> I have, I, I had a DVD copy of this film, to be clear. So it, like, a, it was a bootleg. So I was mm-hmm. able to watch it in the original Japanese. I do have a lot of nostalgia for this dub, all the same. I listened to snippets of it, but of course, very recently. And I feel like the dub is at the intersection of amateur and hammy, which when you get that energy, it tends to produce a dub with a lot of character. I'm thinking of the first giant robo dub. These have surely gained us the upper hand now they can never win the battle is over with ha- which has some like really awkward lines and throws in expletives where there shouldn't be expletives i get like a lot of those vibes from this dub and i appreciate it i've had a feeling the voice actors had a lot of fun with some of the scenes and i have a feeling they weren't given a lot a whole lot of direction or a whole lot of opportunity to redo lines a pilot of the joint forces lieutenant hikaru hichiko Thank you, Lieutenant. Yeah, there's a lot of lines. Like when he says Hikaru Ichiko, it's clear that it's a first read, like first time, last time. And it, this was all dubbed in Hong Kong, so it's a lot of British people that they just sort of brought in that weren't necessarily actors. And it shows. It's more reminiscent of like if you watch dubs of old kung fu movies too. Mm, that's that, yeah, yeah. That's this kind of dub. It has a very distinct charm, especially for something this gorgeous. And like you rarely see this for like really good, high quality anime. I love it. I think it's hilarious when um, Hikaru shouts, as um, Roy Foker dies, because he's supposed to shout Roy or some, literally anything else, but he just goes, Ming Mei. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> they constantly goof lines. Just watch Jet Junkie in action. Roy has a bunch of good lines in this one. So what? You can still fight when you're drunk? He's already always slurring his lines, so when he's drunk, it just makes it even better. Roy drunk was the, definitely the highlight. Yes, exactly. Um, I really like the Zentradi delivery in that one, too. Really good stuff. I think it really puts a point on how obnoxious the the Max's last name is genius jokes are. You really are a genius, Kakazaki says. Oh god, I can just quote it. Like that's, that makes up a huge chunk of my lexicon and what I think is funny. <laughs> just quotes from that dub. I think it's incredibly charming. There was a point where when I watched this film all the time, I would watch it like just to put on the dub because I wanted something kind of fun to listen mm-hmm. to. Like, that wasn't quite so heavy, but yeah, no, good stuff. And. Uh, that leads us to just final thoughts on the uh, film. What you guys think of it, uh, Austin? The only thing more thrilling than getting to watch this for the podcast is knowing that in March of last year, Big West stopped getting mugged in an alley by Harmony Gold, and that this <laughs> film could get an official stateside release, potentially becoming more well known. Uh, Do you remember Love? Is one of those like rare films that I can watch multiple times and enjoy thoroughly. It's it's still very impressive. 
likable movie. I think any fan of anime whatsoever has a chance of enjoying this film. Everybody from the Cowboy Bebop frat guys to the middle school girls who check out Fruit Basket from the library. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope over time more people will discover love and the huge ship with the cool people that kept the song alive. Great movie, perhaps among the best I've seen in the genre, but I'm fairly new here. For sure, for sure. There's a universal appeal to it that I think is, is pretty special. Uh, Steven, thoughts on the film? There's a real grindhouse element to this. I might be the first person to ever utter, like, do you remember love and grindhouse in the same sentence? But the one thing we didn't mention is the film is hyper gratuitous at times um, with some of like the kills, like yes. the, face, the heads exploding in the cockpits and like that one dude's head getting cut off. I was like, wow, I did not see that coming. And um, tonally at times, especially for how sexual the film can get, it reminds me of like a classic grindhouse film. And I feel like the ideal way to view this film is collectively in a theater. I by no means am gatekeeping here. I mean, enjoy this film however you like. Like Ethan watching that dub, um, one of the few people to enjoy that dub, I think. But <laughs> I, I can imagine like being in a theater, collectively either rolling your eyes at the stereotypes or like embracing like the shit you like. I feel like that's the ideal environment for this. Because not only do you have like a fun communal element, because you like you know the, the tropes, you know the beats, but experiencing that with the crowd only amplifies your enjoyment of it. And plus, you can just feast on the visuals on the screen. So I'm really hoping for a potential future theater release. For sure, for sure, yes. It, it deserves to be seen on the big screen with that emphasis on scale, like you were even discussing earlier and that sort of thing. It's a, it's a big movie. It feels like a big deal, and it is a big deal. And even those, those grindhouse moments, they're like just the right amount of violent to like kind of elicit a big reaction from an audience um, in a way or yeah. like the really gratuitous shower scene where they really amp up like yeah well you got a taste of this in the TV series now here's the real one where she's spinning around and you just see everything I feel like too like the music lends itself to a communal experience because then you could like literally sing the songs with the crowd and anime crowds at movie theaters love that shit I mean, mm -hmm. how many, I saw premiere like twice in theaters, and sometimes the crowds could be a little obnoxious with it, but it's always fun to like, you know, sing Kakusei with the, all the anime fans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the musical element of it really lends it to a communal sort of screening, definitely. Um, especially, you know, the, the title track is just so iconic as, as anime yeah. music goes. And I feel like that way, some of the problematic elements go down easier when you're experiencing with a group of people. Because when you're experiencing by yourself, I feel like those elements are a little bit more glaring. I definitely think so. It's it, it can be very thoughtful and meditative, but it can also be very silly. Again, there's a little something here for everyone, but that's our time for the day. Um, it was an absolute treat talking about this. Uh, and big thanks to Steven, both for having me on for Macross Plus and for coming on here. Oh, of course. Uh, Steven, if you want to, uh, any last minute opportunity to, to re-plug any of your stuff or plug anything new that you forgot in the opening. Uh, oh yeah, I love to shill for what I'm doing. Um, so I'm on Twitter, I'm at underscore Steven underscore hero. I'm usually for my personal account retweeting stuff from my other accounts, which are the Giant Robo FM account. So Giant Robot FM. I don't know why I said Giant Robo FM. And I also run a Twitter account called Daily underscore Mecca, which every day I post a new mech, which is fun work, but it's surprisingly exhausting work tracking down the information and tracking down a new mech each day. So definitely feel free to follow that and definitely check out our podcast. If you only have like a cursory interest in mecha, like you're interested in the genre, but you can't commit to a weekly podcast, I definitely recommend recommend you check out our history episodes. We do a deep dive into the production of every show we cover. I put those together. It's it's a, it's a lot of work. I enjoy it. Um, but they happen roughly around every few months. We're going to do a Gundam 0079 history episode. We just did a Macross Plus history episode. And we are set to cover Gundam The Origin, the six episode OVA plus the 12 volume manga later this spring. So look forward to that. Yes, and, and look forward to maybe somebody else on this podcast being on Gundam The Origin episode question mark. But yeah, I'll probably be back um, and definitely check oh, out definitely. that uh, that Macross Plus episode four podcast with me if you want to hear my awful voice squawking about Robotech um, for too long and about why uh, Zentradi being depicted as uncool caricatures is uncool. But now it's our turn to shill. So for all of you viewing on YouTube, uh, be sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment to boost us in the algorithm. That stuff's great. Um, if you want a special uncensored version of this podcast, check us out on Spotify Video. Ooh, you can hear all the F-words. How exciting. 
Wait, is is Roy Fokker an F word then? <laughs> Would that be bleeped out? I feel like you said Fokker, but I feel like everyone else pronounces Fokker, and they're not joking. I I feel like it all depends on what YouTube thinks of it more than anything. <laughs> we'll see. The censors for Fokker might be a little bit different. On. Uh, we might have to do one of those post cuts. And if you're just listening, be sure to follow us on your podcatcher of choice. Give us a high rating. Spotify has ratings now, so give us five stars on that. And uh, if you like what we do, we have a Patreon um, down in the description bit. So feel free to to send us real money dollars there um, so we can we can do more things. And Giant Robot FM also has a Patreon, so definitely give them money too, because they actually have like bonus podcast content that you get from that, um, like B-plots. Yeah, if you want to hear me talk about Star Wars, jump right in. Yes, you don't even have to pay us to listen to our stakes, takes on Star Wars. Be sure to join us next week for our podcast on 2022's The Batman. Same bomb time, same bomb channel. Yak de culture, and see you next time. Just watch Jet Jockey in action. I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.